Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the seventh video in the series on radiographic equipment. In this video, we'll be wrapping up the control of scattered radiation by looking at the methods that prevent produced scattered photons from reaching the image receptor. In the last video, we looked at the low kilovoltage approach, reduction of tissue thickness, and the beam restriction approach as methods of reducing the amount of scattered photons that are produced. The next set of methods of reducing scatter are not concerned with how much scatter is produced. Instead, these methods focus on preventing whatever amount of scatter that has been produced from reaching the image receptor. The two common methods under this group are the use of devices called grids and the air gap technique. We start out with the grids. A grid is a device made of multiple strips of lead that are separated from each other by a radiolescent material, also known as the interspacing material. How does the grid function in preventing scatter from reaching the image receptor? The lead strips are arranged side by side. X-ray photons move in straight lines and will pass the interspaces between lead strips, avoiding getting absorbed by the lead strips. On the other hand, scattered photons do not move in straight lines, this way, most of the scattered photons wouldn't easily pass through the interspaces, they would be absorbed by the lead strips. Observe this on the diagram by your left hand side. While the black primary photons easily pass through the interspacing material, the red scattered photons are not moving straight and are absorbed by the lead strips. This is the basic manner by which grids function. Grids have certain characteristics that determine how they function. The first we'd be looking at is the grid ratio. It is the ratio of the height of the lead strips to the thickness of the interspacing material. Bear in mind that the height of the lead strips is basically talking about its thickness. You'd find grid ratios such as 8 to 1, 10 to 1, 12 to 1, and so on. The higher the grid ratio, the more scatter that would be absorbed, because a high grid ratio means that the lead strips are thicker, and a thick lead strip will absorb more scatter than a thin one. However, because the lead strips are thicker, high ratio grids are also likely to absorb some primary photons. This will lead to a reduction in density on the radiographic image, because some of the photons that should form useful densities on the image are absorbed and do not make it to the image receptor. This is known as geometrical cutoff, and it is for this reason that when a radiographer uses a grid for an exposure, he or she needs to increase the exposure factors compared to when a grid is not used. This helps to compensate for the useful photons absorbed. Next is the grid lattice or grid frequency. It is measured in lines per centimeter or lines per inch. The grid lattice is the number of lead strips that are present in each centimeter of the grid's width. You can have a grid lattice of 60 lines per centimeter, which implies that 60 lead strips are present in each centimeter of the grid. Some are as high as 100 lines per centimeter. A grid of low lattice, that is a grid with fewer lead strips, is going to produce an image with reduced recorded detail. This is because low lattice grids usually have wider lead strips to make up for their fewer number. These wider lead strips will be more visible on a radiographic image, this reduces the recorded detail of the image. On the other hand, a grid with high lattice has thinner lead strips, these are less visible on the image, giving it better detail. However, the thin strips of the high lattice grids makes them less efficient in absorbing scattered photons. Some scatter bypasses these thinner strips. Another disadvantage of high lattice grids is that they are more difficult to produce, making them more expensive. Now let us look at the types of grids. The first is the parallel grid. In this configuration, the lead strips are arranged side by side, parallel to each other. Because of this arrangement, this type of grid does not have a front or back. Either side can be placed on the image receptor. This makes it much easier to use as error due to an upside-down grid cannot occur. However, the parallel grid has its problems. Because the lead strips are parallel to each other, the parallel grid tends to absorb some primary photons, the ones at the peripheral edges of the X-ray beam. This is because peripheral photons do not move in a straight line like a photons at the center, they diverge, almost like how scatter diverges. The parallel grid treats these peripheral photons like scatter, it absorbs them, as you can see on the diagram. This produces geometrical cut-off along the edges of the image. It can be reduced by increasing the source image distance, which makes the beam less divergent. Also, grids with a low ratio produce less of this peripheral geometrical cutoff than high ratio grids, this is because of the reduced thickness of lead in low ratio grids. However, with low ratio grids comes more scatter passing through to the image receptor. 
The effect can also be reduced by using only the center of the receptor for image acquisition. However, this only applies in examination of small anatomical parts. Lastly, peripheral cutoff can be reduced by something known as pseudo-focusing. In this, the manufacturer reduces the height of the lead strips at the edges of the grid, the peripheral lead strips. As you can see on the diagram below, this makes it easier for the divergent peripheral photons to pass through. The next type of grid is the focused grid. In this, the lead strips are not parallel to each other. Instead they are tilted in a manner that every lead strip is focused towards the center of the X-ray tube. This way, the divergence of the X-ray beam is matched, with less peripheral geometrical cutoff occurring. However, focused grids have their problems. First, it has a front and a back. This means that the radiographer must pay extra attention to avoid placing it upside down. Secondly, different focused grids are made for different source image distances. If the wrong SID is used for a focused grid, geometric cutoff is produced. What all this means is that, using focused grids require more carefulness and expertise than using parallel grids. The next type of grid is the crossed grid. In this type, two parallel or two focused grids are combined in a manner that their lead strips intersect each other at 90 degrees. This gives it the resemblance of a chessboard when you look at it from up. It is designed this way to allow it to absorb scatter in two directions. The problem with this grid is that, because it has twice the lead strips, any error in its use will produce twice the geometrical cutoff. Also, because the lead strips are in two directions, you cannot angulate the beam. When this grid is used, only straight X-ray beams can be used. Lastly, the presence of more lead strips makes them even more visible, producing reduced detail. When a grid is not properly placed, geometric cutoff can occur in different manners. These errors are known as malpositioning errors. The first we'll be looking at is the off-level error. This malpositioning error occurs in all types of grids. In this error, the grid is tilted such that the lead strips are no longer parallel to the X-ray beam. As seen on the diagram, this error will cause the grid to absorb primary photons at the center and side closer to the tube, allowing only photons at the side of the grid that is away from the tube to pass through to the image receptor. This produces geometrical cutoff at the center and on one end of the image. Next is the off-center error. It also occurs in all types of grids. It happens when the beam is incorrectly centered on the grid. The X-ray tube should be properly centered to the middle of the grid. When this is not so, geometrical cutoff happens on one side of the image. Next is the off-focus error. This occurs in focused and cross-focused grids. Remember when we said that different focused grids are made for different source image distances? Well, if you use a focused grid at an SID that it is not designed for, you'd get the off-focused error. For example, a focused grid can be labeled for use at SID of between 90 and 130 centimeters. This means if you use an SID that is smaller than 90, or an SID bigger than 130, an off-focused error would occur. The manufacturer made the 90 to 130 centimeter grid to be used at distances like 90, 95, 103, 127, these fall within its range and would not produce an error. An off-focused error is seen as geometrical cutoff along the sides of the imp. Lastly, the upside-down grid error. This occurs in focused and cross-focused grids. These two types of grids have a front and a back. They are normally placed with the back touching the surface of the image receptor and the front facing up. When it is unknowingly placed upside down, severe geometrical cutoff is seen on the sides of the image. Earlier, we learned that when grid lines are visible on a radiograph, the recorded detail is reduced. We said that a way of reducing the visibility of grid lines is by using high lattice grids with tinier lead strips. We however stated that those types of grids are more expensive and tend to be less effective in absorbing scatter. An alternative and honestly, far more common method of making grid lines less visible on the image is through a process known as grid movement. This is the sideways movement of the grid during an exposure. This motion would cause the grid lines to be blurred out and much less visible. The system that causes this movement was originally invented by German radiologist, Dr. Gustav Bucky, and was improved by American radiologist, Dr. Hollis Potter. This gave it the name Potter Bucky diaphragm. The image receptor is fitted into this device, which contains a grid and a mechanism that causes the grid to move. It was originally fitted under the X-ray table, but is advanced into other forms, such as the erect Bucky, used for erect radiographic exams. But, like with most good things of life, grid movement has a few setbacks. 
First, a small amount of off-center errors occur due to the sideways movement of the grid. Also, the movement can cause the cassette to vibrate, leading to movement on sharpness on the image. Lastly, the Bucky device does not allow the cassette to be in contact with the anatomy. This introduced object image distance would cause a bit of magnification and geometric unsharpness. Let us look at some movement types used by different Potter Bucky diaphragms. First is the reciprocating movement. In this, the grid is made to move fast in one direction and slowly in the other. Throughout the exposure, it moves like this. Second is the oscillating or vibrating movement. In this, the grid moves to and fro repeatedly while vibrating. This vibration helps to solve a problem that occurs in the reciprocating movement, known as the stroboscopic effect. The stroboscopic effect is simply when a moving grid appears like it is not moving and still produces grid lines. Vibration helps to avoid this. Next movement is the catapult movement. Unlike in the first two, the catapult movement makes just one movement across the film. This movement starts out very fast, but slows down until it finally stops at the end of the exposure. Last is the single stroke movement. The radiographer manually causes this movement by pulling a cock lever on the device before the exposure. It is however the less common movement today. Now that we have looked extensively at grids and how they function, let us look at the second method of preventing produced scatter from reaching the image receptor, the air gap technique. It involves introducing distance between the anatomical part and the image receptor, an air gap. You would notice that on the diagram by your left hand side, the object is in contact with the image receptor, and a lot of scatter reaches the image receptor. Meanwhile, on the diagram by your right hand side, the OID gives room for the deflected scattered photons to continue to diverge out of the range of the image receptor. This reduces the amount of scatter that reaches the image receptor. It has been observed through experience that, on a 10 cm thick body part, a 25 cm OID will have the same effect as a 15 to 1 ratio grid on removing scatter. While the air gap technique is undoubtedly helpful in removing scatter, the grids are still the preferred option because OID causes unsharpness and magnification. That concludes the control of scattered radiation. If you loved this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.